Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra, and I want to say thank you for all of the love on our 100th episode last week. I am thrilled to be right back here for 101, and yeah, we don't have Dalmatians, but we still have plenty of softball to talk about. So first, some quick reminders for the show. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. Believe in Softball is also on YouTube, so subscribe there too because the video is worth it. All right, let's go through today's batting order. First, we will cover our bases, give you some news and call-outs from around the softball world. Then we'll head into today's interview with Jordan Taylor. She's from SoCal too, not too far from me. We actually pitched against each other in high school at one point. She went on to become the 2010 Big Ten Pitcher of the Year, and she played pro ball in multiple leagues, just recently retired. So this is one of her first conversations after hanging the cleats up. Then we'll end things with the foul tip of the week, which are tips to help us keep going and get better. All right, let's go. Covering our bases. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports, contests, and events with first-to-market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sports information from live in-game betting, props, and futures. Head to bet online today or use your mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code believe 50 that's five zero to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit bet online where the game starts, but where it ends in some ways for Carol Hutchins, the head coach of Michigan softball is now she is officially retiring after 38 years leading that program. It is insane to think about. And if you just think about all that she has accomplished, it's even more wild. The winningest coach in NCAA softball history. She literally has 1,707 wins. Her career winning percentage is 755. Career. She has won in her career three quarters of the games that she has played. Over that kind of time span, I can't even begin to tell you how impressive that is. You think about like, yes, all the top teams that they had, but also all the rebuilding years and all the challenges that coaches face, especially like from one decade to the next and as the game has evolved. So the fact that that's her win percentage is wild to me. She never had a losing season ever. Insane. Also the winningest coach, male or female in Michigan athletics history. And you think about the type of programs that they've had across different sports come out of that university That is incredibly impressive. And then for softball, of course, the 2005 National Championship, which was the first time a program from east of the Mississippi was able to do that. And you remember we talked about that with Samantha Finley when she came on the show. She was on that team, had some clutch moments getting it done for the Wolverines. Also, 22 Big Ten championships on top of it. Not really a surprise when you think about it that she is in the NFCA Hall of Fame and also was the Big Ten Coach of the Year 18 times. To sum it up, she's just a legend in the coaching ranks, but not a lot of people know this. Also a two-sport athlete at Michigan State. She played basketball and softball. She's actually in the Athletics Hall of Fame there as well. And you just have to think about how rare that is for someone to be a legend at two rival schools like Michigan and Michigan State. That woman owns the state of Michigan, period. And yes, all of these accolades and accomplishments are super impressive, and it's important to think about when you think about her legacy, but I feel like her presence and her energy and that fire is really what we're going to remember the most as well. You know, I just have that picture in my head of her getting fired up at any of the dozen women's college world series that she went to and that sort of fist bump and that smile that takes over her entire face, you know, that is what you think about when you think about Hutch. And I think that that's kind of how we feel when we think about her, like that's how she's leaving us feeling with that, like sort of fist pump and smile that we got to have her in our community for so long. And in addition to that, associate head coach Bonnie Thal was promoted to the head job. And she's been on the staff with Hutch forever, 29 years, 20 of which she's been the associate head coach. And then here she is going into her 30th and she's going to be at the top now. And our guest today, Jordan, actually commented on the announcement post that was shared when the news came out that she's the best recruiter in the game. 
I really like when I see, and I, I just appreciate when internal talent is recognized and celebrated like this. And I don't just mean softball. I don't even just mean sports, just kind of in general. You know, when you see that dedication has paid off and there's a lot of value, like for this example of having someone who bleeds blue, right? You just can't replace that experience, that knowledge, and that passion. I felt similarly when seeing Caitlin Lowe take over at Arizona after Mike Candrea, who's by the way, the number two winningest softball coach of all time. And she, you know, having played there and everything was there for a long time. And that was only a fraction of what Bonnie and Hutch did at Michigan. So really what it comes down to is I want to say thank you, Hutch, and good luck, Bonnie. And actually, one way that we'll be able to follow them, as usual, is with ESPN and all the coverage they do for softball, but some exciting announcements just around some of the folks who make that happen for us. You know, the VP in charge of softball at ESPN, Meg Ronowitz, was recently named earlier this month to the Sports Business Journal's Game Changers class of 2022. This is the 12th class that they've had. There's basically 50 women who are innovators and just trailblazers. And the way they describe it, this program and this recognition is basically these are people that are strengthening this industry and their organizations too, depending on where they're at, through thought leadership and deal making and just mentorship of the next generation as well of diverse sports business executives. So they're going to profile them in a special section in uh, on September 26th. And then there's going to be a Game Changers conference on October 26th at MetLife Stadium to celebrate as well. But in addition to that, the voice that we're all so used to hearing is Beth Moens, and she had a contract extension. Not sure if everybody saw this already. It's really an unspecified length, but multiple years. We have had her for 20 plus years as the primary voice of the Women's College World Series, but also covers college football, basketball, some NFL. She did softball in the Olympics as well for NBC in Tokyo. A lot of people don't know this about her either, but she played a little bit of softball when she was younger, and now it's cool because we'll get her indefinitely. Just a lot of women, I think, right now who have made an incalculable impact on softball, women, and sports that we can celebrate. And the ones who are paying it forward, there are a lot of folks in Athletes Unlimited that are doing that in pro softball. This is the last week. Like, this is it. Week five, the champion's going to be crowned this weekend. And it still kind of blows my mind, to be honest, that it's season three of AU or even three and a half, if you count AUX earlier this summer, because I've been watching this. I've been covering this league since the beginning and it started with softball and it's only grown with more sports and even more talent. So it's just crazy to think back on in the best way. And Deja Molipola holds that number one spot, Manchester at number two and Haley McClenney at number four. They've been kind of consistently towards the top this season. But meanwhile, Alyssa Denham has surged to that number three spot, kind of tied with McClenney right there near the top. And I will say she rose 10 spots on the leaderboard after having pitched two complete games. It included a three hit shutout and a pitcher's duel versus Rachel Garcia, which by the way, throwback to the Pac-12 that we used to see when they were in college. But she earned all available win points, stat points, and she got some MVP one honors as well. Now she's a first-time captain in the last weekend of games, which will be cool. She'll have a little bit more control over her fate. And I have to give a little shout-out to Arizona softball, too. I mean, two alums in the top four and three in the top five because Danielle O'Toole is in that number five spot right now. So a lot of good product coming out of Tucson, that's for sure. Kaylee Clifton and Taylor McQuillan also rose 20 spots after week four as well. And all this leapfrogging in week four, to me, it reminds us that every single inning Every at-bat, every pitch matters. It all adds up in the end. And we talk about that in general with softball. You know, take things one pitch at a time because every moment matters in that way. But the way that AU is structured really hammers it home, too. And this is, you know, it's the end of pro softball season in the States. So just tune in and see how it all goes down. I know I'm really excited to see. But someone who knows all about all kinds of pro softball and what it's like to play for Hutch is today's guest. So let's head into the interview. She is a three-time All-American from Michigan, four-time Big Ten champion, two-time World Cup champion with Team USA, longtime pro player in Japan, newly retired WPF pitcher for the USSSA Pride, and NPF veteran. 
Jordan Taylor. Jordan, thank you for joining. I'm excited about this. Yes, thanks for having me. <laughs> you know, it's funny too, as I was thinking about our conversation, I was thinking back, and I think I mentioned this to you when I reached out, but you went to Valencia High School. Mm-hmm. I went to Westlake High School in Southern California. And I think that we played each other in CIF. I want to say it was like my freshman year. And I think we played at Valencia, I believe. And I remember it partly because the paper actually completely butchered how to spell my last name, which happens a lot in my life, but it was like one of the worst ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I um, I was talking to my mom and I was like, yeah, Jenna, she went to Westlake and I couldn't remember your name, out, the last name out of the top of my head. And she's like, oh, Basira. I was like, how do you remember? This? And my mom remembers everything. I remember nothing. Like, <laughs> I feel like that could be an advantage though. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Great. Me me and your mom should hang out then. Um, But I feel like that's kind of a good thing to have like a short-term memory as an athlete or it's, it's not a bad thing at least. Yeah. The only long-term memory I have are people who might change up for home runs. Those are my, that's Mm. my only long-term memory that kind of sticks, but I mean, you could have played on the last game. I would have absolutely no idea. (laughs) I don't think nothing. (laughs) <laughs> I don't think many people did that to you in high school, let's let's just say. So I mean we'll... 40 feet. That was, <laughs> that was a little unfair. True. Feet. True. <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> but that well, that's the other thing too. Then I got to thinking about high school a little bit. I was like, wow, throwback, right? Um, and I actually did see you post recently that about your coach who just retired too, yeah. Donna Lee. And you said something along the lines. Yeah. Something along the lines of like a lot of people credit Hutch at Michigan for your like tough attitude on the mound, but without Donna Lee that you would have, I think you said melted like an ice cream in the desert at Michigan, which I was laughing out loud at. <laughs> I would have absolutely crumbled. <laughs> no, Donna Lee, she was tough. She was, a, she, she was there, I think it was 28 years or something like that, um, which obviously Hutch is like 38, I think, at this point. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, she definitely, she whipped us into shape. And that's, I mean... High school season is a joke for a lot of people. Um, it's just kind of a supplementary thing. And Donna, Donna didn't let us get away with anything. She she has running miles and all sorts of stuff. So um, yeah, no, she's definitely a big reason why um, I was successful. Well, that's part of the reason I found it refreshing. Like when I saw that you posted that, I was like, yeah, because a lot, we talk so much obviously about college and pro and international, but then it's travel ball really that we talk about when we grow up. But like a lot of us did play high school softball, you know? So it's, you know, any experience, every experience shapes us eventually. So I'm glad that you had a really positive one in high school. Well, I mean, the years that I was there at Valencia, especially my junior, senior year, like our roster was ridiculous. I think like all nine starters went to like top 25 schools. Like if you just look back at kind of Valencia, Simi Valley, like that area for the last 20 years, I mean, the players that they've turned out is just ridiculous. There's something in the water. (laughs) Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, that's like, that's just the hotbed. Right. And it, it it, like still is to a certain degree. It's like Orange County gets the like, you know, praise and all that, which obviously they have really good players, but you look at some of the players that came out of, out of uh, the other Valley. It's, it's pretty, pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Cause I'm, so I'm from Ventura County. I mean, Westlake's like near TO, but I actually grew yeah. up in Camarillo, which is where Jessica Mendoza's from. And so yeah. I, I agree with you. It's like, yes, we all probably traveled to Orange County constantly every weekend to play in tournaments, but there actually was a lot of talent right in the backyard too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But then when you did get to Michigan eventually, so mm-hmm. you're you're like, yeah, I would have crumbled if not for Donna <laughs> Lee. But what do you feel like you learned the most during your time there from Hutch or just in general from your experience? Um, oof. Definitely adversity and like learning to roll with the punches. Um, I kind of... I was very bitter about my career at Michigan for a long time um, with the whole illegal pitch debacle. And um, mm. because I mean, for a really long time, and I mean, I still kind of feel that way about it too. I just felt like my four years was like stolen from me because I was every season, I couldn't work on anything except for keeping my foot down a quarter of an inch. If that, it wasn't even a quarter of an inch. Like 
my, my metal spike was still on the ground at some point. Um, so yeah, definitely like going through that and having to work through that every turn. Like I just, I couldn't focus on anything else except for that one tiny little thing. And it was so frustrating because basically they're asking me to reverse 15 years of, of pitching in one, one weekend. And, um, if I heard one more time, just keep your toe down. I'm like, you just keep your toe down. Um, but yeah, so I, was, I was very bitter about it for a while, but it definitely helped me. Um, and I mean, taught me, um, well, not taught me, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not very good at keeping my mouth shut during <laughs> to umpires and stuff. I think that kind of lit my fire and, um, I'm kind of known as the one who yells at umpires now, unfortunately, but, um, yeah, definitely rolling with punches and just learning to kind of grind through anything and everything that they throw at you. I think I saw a video, maybe it was a TikTok or something. I'm actually not on TikTok, but I see them on the reels on Instagram, so I don't even know. But I saw a video <laughs> you made of like all of your reactions to umpires uh, um, in this last um, season for <laughs> in Japan. Yeah. And I was yeah. laughing at that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I have the advantage of they don't understand what I'm saying. Well, True. for the most for the most part, some of them do. Um, but that was the first thing that I said when I came back because I hadn't played when I went to Pride this summer. I hadn't played in the states for five years, I think. Um, wow. And that was the first thing I said to head coach Kelly Crutchman. I was like, I have to watch what I say. I'm so used to them not being able to understand what I'm saying, and I yell all sorts of stuff back in the <laughs> So I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta bite my tongue a little bit but um yeah I was okay they that's, didn't know the rules really anyway so it's fine yeah <laughs> well it's funny because actually so the last interview I did our last episode was Dot Richardson and she made a comment at one point she was like softball players you know we know that like life's not fair we have to get through adversity she's like and why do we know life's not fair because we have umpires <laughs> and I was like great point <laughs> yeah yeah, I've, worldwide, they just don't seem to like me very much. That's, that's kind of a running joke. They didn't like me in Australia. They don't like me in Japan. They didn't like me here either. So, I mean, at, at some point, you have to look inward, right? <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> but I but I like the, the element of this that I like is that you are yourself in general. You know, yes. not just with the umpires, but in general, it feels like you kind of stand your ground in terms of your sense of self. I even see that, like and I'm sure this is like not always fun, but with some of like the Twitter trolls and things like that, I feel like you're like, nope, I'm just going to be me. This isn't like a conversation. This is how it is, which like is refreshing. Yeah. I mean, to a fault sometimes, I think sometimes, <laughs> sometimes those words can stay in my mouth. I don't need to go out on Twitter, but um, yeah, I mean, like I just some of these t Twitter trolls are like hilarious only because I think, especially as young women like we're told and like mansplained and just told stuff about our career and our sport and it's like huh like I I still remember um someone was arguing with me about uh crow hopping and I was arguing mm -hmm. my point of like I just didn't think that it gained that much of an advantage to where it was that big of an issue whatever we can get rid of it you have it legal in in ISF and in international, make it legal in NCAA. And so I was yeah. arguing this point. <laughs> this this woman came back to me and she goes, You don't have to be so mean about it. Like you don't have to be <laughs> such a know it all about it. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like <laughs> you you told me I was wrong. I told you why I didn't think I was wrong, and now you're calling me mean. And so I was like, you know what? After that point, I was like, I'm gonna say what I want. <laughs> I can deal with it. So um yeah, I mean, some of them get a little a little wild, but Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's fun. I yeah, I I should I should be quiet most of the time, but <laughs> most of the time well, it's good. <laughs> I mean, as somebody who sometimes wishes I would say more, it you know, there's I guess there's a middle ground. Maybe we can meet in the middle. But it, it, I'm like, oh, I, I could do that a little bit more. If that, I don't know if that makes you feel any better. But 
I get like my friends will text me every once in a while and they're like, Jordan, I stood up for myself. I, I ask myself, like, what would Jordan do? What would Jordan say? And I'm like, good job, guys. <laughs> That's funny. I've had like a couple of my friends text me in the last couple months. Like, I just I just asked myself what Jordan would say. Like, um, I'm I glad feel like I'm- that's, <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing thing to be known for, especially with people that are like that close to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have some really great friends, so it's good. Well, good that sign. always helps yes. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like you've made a lot of good relationships just throughout your career too. Because here's the thing. It's funny to me that that, that person said something to you about being a know-it-all because I'm like, okay, not a know-it-all, but you have the experience, like you're literally the type of person that should be commenting on something yeah. like that because yeah. of everything that you've experienced. And you played not only pro, but you played in a bunch of different leagues in the pro landscape also with mm-hmm. like the first year of WPF, Japan, MPF, even Australia you played in, right? So for you, it's like, what's the biggest thing you took away from each of those experiences? Ooh, um, that you can never stop learning for sure. Um, I I mean, obviously, I love the game of softball because I've been playing it forever. Um, But I love the most was that, you know, someone like me and Kaylani Ricketts, Chelsea Thomas, we're all very similarly built. And we all kind of throw, not similar, but like change up, throw a little bit harder. I wasn't throwing as hard as them in the last couple of years, but... And then you can take that and have somebody, you know, like Kat Osterman, you could have, um, like, even like someone like Keely Richard, like, she's not as tall, or Danielle Laurie, like, you can just have all these different pitchers who excel at these different levels and do it their own way. And they're still successful in their own way. And so, I mean, I always loved, like, learning about, you know, how someone else did it. Not enough to be in their bullpen being like, hey, how'd you do that? What are you doing there? But um, just like watching how, how people could be successful in a different way, I think was always like, it was just so much fun. So um, yeah, that's definitely, because I mean, even if you look at the way Japan plays softball, it takes so many, so many people, it takes them a really long time to be successful in Japan because they play so differently. It's so fast. Like I was trying to tell Odyssey Alexander was on our team and I was trying to explain to her kind of like, you know, you'll feel like you're rolling. You'll feel like six innings and you're just like getting so many swings and misses and all that. And then you blink and all of a sudden it's three runs on the board and you're like, what happened? (laughs) What what happens? So um, it just moves so quickly. And even like Australia, like they do not have the prettiest swings some of their most successful players, but they hit the absolute crap out of the ball. So it's like, you know, you have all these like purists and you have to like look this exact exact way and you have to pitch this exact way. You have to hit this exact way. And it's just, that's not true at all. Just size, shape, different ways of doing things It all. There's so many different ways of doing things to be successful in this game. It is so true. It's actually one of my favorite things about our game, I think, is that so many different types of people like and I've said this before. So listeners will be like, yeah, we get it, Jenna. But like, (laughs) it seems like you would agree. You know, you can tell, for example, like in college, if the women's basketball or volleyball teams walking by, you're like, okay, Mm -hmm. they're all very tall, right? Like, or even if it's like the gymnasts are walking by, you're like, okay, you can kind of tell they're either gymnasts or like the guys might be wrestlers or whatever. But with softball, it's like people wouldn't always guess like if we didn't literally have a t-shirt that said softball they'd be like oh well what sport you know you can't tell as much because there are so many different types of people like you said size size shape like height but also like style and like different ways I don't know that you just even athleticism like expressed in different ways everything's just so unique and I feel like we're biased but that's special to softball we got it every every time we go in the airport. Oh, what sport are you guys? And every time yeah. we play softball, they're like, "Really?" I'm like, what do yeah. you think the softball player look like? Like, yeah. I know. Have you gotten the question? This would, would come in like high school, for example, from like other like guys athletes. They'd be like, "Do you guys pit like throw underhand like when you're throwing to first base too?" Um, and I'm like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> no. They're like, "Like in the infield?" I was like, "No, what? Like, what are you talking about?" <laughs> 
Um, no, no, I definitely didn't get that question. <laughs> yeah, maybe I just went to school with idiots. Who knows? <laughs> but, but yeah, I think that that's a really good point, though, just like from your experiences. It seems like Japan was a particularly special experience, too, because I saw you say also on social media that one of your favorite Japanese words basically means that people come into your life for a reason. So I would ask you, like, what is the word? So I don't butcher it. And what are some of your biggest examples? Yeah, so it's N. Um, I actually have it tattooed on my back. Um, I got it tattooed. So I was there two years straight out of college, and I played for a team called Denso. Um, that's who Carly Hoover currently plays for. Um, and then left for five years um, and was right in the middle or – the weekend before I think it was season started, I was at Loyola Chicago coaching and um, I got a phone call and kind of was like, yeah, no, I'm gone. My poor, my poor head coach, <laughs> my poor oh. head coach. Um, which they end up okay. But um, yeah, it's just uh, Japan is honestly, if you have a chance to go ever go, um, it's just so amazing. The people are amazing. Um, there's some of my best friends still. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it really is just the easiest life over there. Um, you know, transportation is easy. All the food is delicious. Um, everybody's super nice, like I said, but it really is like what you'd think being a pro athlete would be. Like you go to practice, you know, you eat as a team, you train as a team, everything's together. Um, you know, you go on your bus trips, you have meetings, like everything is, I mean, every hour of your day is scheduled. So that kind of, you know, puts some people off, but, um, yeah, it really, it, that's the easiest job I've ever had in my entire life. Um, and it, I mean, it, it sucked to leave for sure. Um, so I actually med left mid season, um they are going back some of the girls are back now but um it's split into two halves around the international season um this year was a little bit different they had kind of a new league so it went from 22 games total so you played 11 games each half um into Mm. 29 games and it was 22 games the first half and yeah and seven the second um and I just, the thought of getting back in shape and going back over there was just not, (laughs) it was just (laughs) not going to happen. Because that's, I mean, how I've been throwing for so long, I guess, is just, I say I take my off seasons very seriously. Um, You know, I don't look at a ball. I don't touch a ball. Um, I still work out, obviously. But um, yeah, I just, my shoulder has been hanging on by a thread, I think, since I was 16. So I just... (sighs) I needed a break and the thought at 33 of going back again was <laughs> going to kill me. So <laughs> decided not to go back, but yeah. Well, that's understandable. I mean, you have to put your health also sounds like a mental health too, though, like taking a break, right? Like from things uh, first yes, or else. Definitely. Yeah. But then you decided to come back and you did play in the first year ever of WPF um with pride which is pretty exciting it was like the first year for them but the last year for you to play Mm -hmm. so that's such an interesting like combination that you got to experience this summer yeah well I mean um Kelly Grushman was the head coach and she's one of my best my best friends um I played over in um in Japan with her briefly um but yeah, I mean, she's awesome. And she asked me, they're a little bit desperate for pitchers. Um, I say desperate because they're calling me out of retirement and they're desperate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't have the best time um, in Japan this year. Uh, we had a new head coach and um, basically he told me that I wasn't going to start games because I wasn't coming back and I'm old. So that oh. was fun. <laughs> Oh no. It was like one of those things where I was like, oh, he said it out loud. He said it. That was what I thought. <laughs> out loud. Okay. Um, and I was just not in a good place. Um, and so when Kelly kind of called up, well, first she texted me and I told her to F off first. <laughs> then um about two weeks later I said, Are you serious? And um, so we kind of started talking about it from there. But um yeah, it was just my mom hasn't seen me throw in oof 
five, no, four years maybe just with COVID and everything. So she was able to see me play again. So that was fun. But um, yeah, it was just kind of the opportunity was there. So it was good circumstances to finish it out. It seemed a little poetic too, because didn't you play like people that you used to play, you played against people you used to play with. And Mm -hmm. it just seemed like a really full circle sort of moment for you at the end there too. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, um, Goody, I think was with us for two seasons, um, before I was traded. And then I played with Shelby, um, played with Kelly. Um, obviously she was a coach then. Um, but there was some like, you know, management switch ups, which made it a little bit easier to come back. And then, I mean, it was just fun too, with, um, you know, Lauren Chamberlain, uh, with being the commissioner of WPF. And she was one of my favorite humans ever, um, especially teammates. And so it was just, it's fun to see, you know, her try to grow the sport and doing what she does best in marketing and, um, you know, just being that kind of light at the, and the tunnel for the sport. So, um, it was special to be a part of that first season and try to, try to get it going. Obviously it was <laughs> not quite the season that they thought it was going to be with two teams, but, um, I know they just signed a third team and it looks like they're getting things going. So that'll be good. Yeah. Yeah, and I hope all of the Oklahoma Twitter fans just heard you praise Lauren Chamberlain so they can all calm down now. Oh, they did not <laughs> care when I said I was friends with. <laughs> they did not <laughs> care at all. It didn't help. It didn't want any rickets coming after you. Um, she she was, like, hyping it up, too. And I was like, Kaylani, I started texting. I was like, stop. Like, you people are crazy. <laughs> I had like 12 year olds calling me all sorts of things in my DMs. And so, yeah, no. Oh my God. They don't care. That's really funny. (laughs) (laughs) That's really funny. But it's funny because you got through it. So that's why it's funny now. (laughs) Yeah. As soon as I started replying with um, Nick Miller from, um, um, oh my gosh, why can't I remember the name of it? Um, New girl. New girl. There you go. I was like, girl. Yeah. yeah. if you've ever seen Nick Miller gifts, they are hilarious and they are never ending. So I just, that was, that was my solution was just to respond to all these trolls with Nick Miller gifts. Um, and it really, it stopped. One, one person like proposed to me out of the thing, out of the Nick Miller gifts. So um, yeah, that's my solution now to any crazy um, Sooner fan is just a Nick Miller gif. It works. <laughs> I feel like that's an amazing coping mechanism. So that's perfect. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're like, why is right. she responding with Nick Miller quotes? <laughs> it's like a, a picture, like a picture says a thousand words. Well, a Nick Miller gift says even more apparently, yeah. which is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's really funny. So I know you talked about too, the fact that you know, you're thinking about your body and how you're trying to take care of your shoulder and some of these factor Mm -hmm. into this, obviously, but even emotionally and everything else mentally, how did you come to the decision? Like, okay, I'm going to retire for real. Yeah. Well, I've tried it a couple of times. Every year I kind of go in, I'm like, okay, this will be the last year. Okay. This will be the last year. And it was definitely, um, it was easier to keep going when it was just Japan because I could kind of live my life three months at a time. Um, and I kind of, I, I definitely worked into a routine of getting back into game shape, um, which was definitely difficult with COVID because over there you had to stay in quarantine. You had to stay in your apartment, um, for 12 days or 14 days. I mean, um, and so that was tough. Like they, they got me kind of a spin bike over there and they like dropped a kettlebell off on my doorstep, but, um, (laughs) Yeah, just, I mean, obviously getting over the jet lag takes a couple days, but you kind of, you get into shape and then you're just like, okay, stay in this 200 foot square foot apartment and you can't go anywhere. Like you can order Uber Eats, but um, yeah, yeah, it was definitely easier to go back when it was just that. I don't think I would have lasted this long doing um, summers as well. Um, But yeah, I mean it's it's mentally exhausting overall just the season of you know being over there and it gets lonely obviously um 
the this was the first season in two years that I had teammates, um, which I actually got used to being on my own. So that was an adjustment on that on that as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, this was just not the greatest season with the head coach and just the how whole like change and everything like that. So it was it was definitely easy to come to that decision. And I mean, our, my last game. Kelly kind of was like, how do you feel? I was like, really? Not, I'm fine. Like, I don't feel any regrets at all. Like, I have no desire to put cleats on again right now. And I mean, maybe I'll feel a little bit different in a couple months, but like, I should be back in Japan right now. And the idea of it is just like, ugh, mm, no thanks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's just, it was definitely, it was just kind of time to move on and do the next thing. Well, that means you were really ready, which is kind of nice because it's on your terms in that way, because it's not always for people, you know? Oh, I know I'm very privileged to um, have the opportunity to announce my retirement instead of getting cut because, I mean, I've been on the other end of all my teammates getting cut and then they just are like, okay, or traded and they just don't want to go to the next team. So they just pack it in and that's... I mean, pretty brutal, especially if you get to the level of playing pro, just to be traded, knowing that they're trading you because they know you're not going to play. That's, it was, it was pretty brutal to see that happen to my friends time and time again. So, um, yeah, no, I definitely know I'm very privileged to like bow out and go on my own terms. Yeah. Have you even had time? Cause this was so recent. <laughs> Have you even had time to actually sit back and just reflect on your career? And I mean, when I say career, I mean, like, since you were a little kid and put the cleats on for the first time until you took them off for the last time recently. Yeah. Well, I was going through, um, I'm actually in my mom's like craft room where she has all of these (laughs) photos. Um, And um, I made like a little video or whatever um, for like the end of um, my career thing. And so it it was fun going through those memories and stuff like that and again like high school I don't remember any of it like (laughs) none of it so I was going through some of these photos I was like oh my gosh we played them I was like oh wow um and so yeah it's it's definitely I don't know how much time it's going to take me to kind of reflect on all of that but um yeah I'll have to go to trip down memory lane other than trying to scrounge up photos and videos for my (laughs) for my video but um (laughs) Yeah, there's definitely the whole room of it. So I'll have to pick out a week to do that. When you said your mom remembers everything, how is she and just your family also handling it since they were obviously there with you every step of the way? Yeah, she was ready for me to be done a while ago. Although she pushed for me to go back to Japan the second time. So um, I just don't think that she expected me to do it this long. Um. But yeah, I think uh, I was always talking about doing kind of like a creative career. Um, And I'm thinking about going back to school right now. I'm actually applying to a couple schools to do that. And so um, I think she was kind of waiting for me to do like, okay. And then, you know, she wants to see me married with babies so she can have grandchildren to dote on. So (laughs) as I tell her, she can have to wait a while for that one. That's not happening anytime soon. So. I know it's like if I feel like I'm lucky because I have an older brother and I have a niece and nephew, so like the pressure's kind of off me. My parents are already grandparents, you know. But you it's go. funny how that's so automatic. Like you start, it like the, and even so many friends, it's like the second they get married, it's like, oh, okay, well, when are you gonna have a baby? You have a baby. Yeah. When are you gonna have your second baby? Like it never ends. A dreaded question. I know it keeps going. She's <laughs> not. She's not pushy for sure. So that's nice. But um, that's good. Yeah. Just the random questions of like, okay, so when are you going to start dating? I'm like, nah, I just got back two seconds ago. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, you're like, let me take a breath first. I know. <laughs> I haven't even unpacked from Japan yet. Like, give me a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I feel you and I support you on that for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I did, it's cool that you're saying that you're thinking about applying for for other things too and kind of mm-hmm. what you're doing next because I know you said like softball was the best first job ever yes which is definitely. true yeah so it's like but what could that second job 
be then? Yeah. Where do you go from here? Well, I mean, that that's, I was, um, for a long time, like I said, I was thinking about retiring. Like every year I kept saying, okay, this is my last year. This is my last year. And I would go and kind of in the off season apply to these jobs that I was not quote unquote technically like qualified for, but like I knew I could do it type of thing. And I'm like, well, if I get, you know, if I got an interview for this job and I got this job and that would make me quit softball, but I wasn't going to mm-hmm. like, you know, quit softball and then go try to find a job that like didn't really make me happy where I knew I was happy playing softball. And yeah. so um, that was it for the longest time. And I was like, I just, I need to find something that would make me want to quit softball or like mm. make me like want to replace this. Um, but when I was, I mean, I was in shape, I was, well, I still am in shape, but I was still like, you know, had the fire to go and do it every day. Um, but yeah, so I'm actually applying to schools in Australia right now. Um, and then I was waitlisted um, and I didn't get in, but um, it was supposed to start in September. And that was another reason why I kind of only decided to do one um, year, but that was in Scotland. Um, and it was for like three uh, theater set design. So it's like creative um, kind of worlds that I want to get into. Um so yeah, it's exciting. It's kind of nerve wracking. Um, the school in Scotland, I literally got to the end of the, like the interview portion. He's like, okay, well, do you have any questions? And I would ask my questions. And he said, well, as you know, there's only four spots available. And I think he thought my the screen like froze because I was like, <coughs> four, <coughs> four spots? <laughs> like in the whole, the whole, pro- he's like, yeah, four spots. So I was like, Nope, didn't wow. know that. Did not know that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So wow. I got, I, I kind of already made the decision that I wasn't going to come back for a second half. Um, and so realistically, I could have done it. I could have gone back. Um, but again, I was just so content and I'm so just, yeah, kind of no regrets right now. So um, now applying to other schools in Australia which won't start till next year, but, um, I have a little bit, you know, I can actually dedicate time to it and have a little bit of a break. Yeah. Well, that's super exciting. And in Australia, I feel like is a really cool, so it's Scotland would have been too, but a really cool place to learn about set design and you went and by the way, I'm not stalking you, but kind of (laughs) when I prepped for this, but you went to Hobbiton, right? In New Zealand. Zealand. I've always wanted to go. That looked awesome. Amazing. And that was actually kind of what kicked it off of, because I've kind of been, I've been creative my whole life of, um, I make a lot of my own clothes. Um, I paint, draw, sculpt, like I do like kind of like all these things. And so, um, when it was coming down to, like, okay, well, what do you want to do with that? I was like, I don't know. Like, what do you do with any of that? So it was actually when we went to Hobbiton that I was kind of walking around. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And I'm like, and my mom said something like, well, like, what about like doing set design? Just as, as moms do, just drop that little, that little pill of knowledge in there. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, kind of from that, I was like, wow, no, that is like set and costume design would be definitely something that would kind of fit all of my things that I do. So um, yeah, they kind of sparked it was Hobbiton. The place was so cool. It was so cool. <laughs> Definitely. It's, <recommend. laughs> yes. It's very high on my list. I have a friend who's from New Zealand. She lives in Australia, but she's from New Zealand and she's been oh, trying no. to get me to visit for literally nine years. Yeah. So <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a must do for me, but that was, that's really cool that, that, sparked that in you because Mm -hmm. I I don't know you're right moms do that they they kind of like leave that little seed but then some things happen and you start to build that interest and you can like feel yourself I don't I I like to see basically when people seem like they have an interest outside of their sport that Mm -hmm. could potentially be as fulfilling or just fulfilling in a different way the way they felt when they played their sport, because not, it's hard to figure that out. So when people have like those feelings, I'm like, yes, good for them. (laughs) Yeah. Which I actually felt guilty for a long time of like not wanting to coach. And I gave, I mean, so after I left Denso, I went to Boston university. I was there for two years and then Loyola Chicago for a season and a half. Um, And I kind of felt guilty of like not wanting to 
pursue that and not wanting to mm. like be a coach because I feel like softball gave me so much and like gave me this great life and all this and like I loved coaching I just really didn't like the BS that came with it um and so it was kind of one of those things to like work through and I was like well maybe I could coach and like do something creative like on the side but then you mm. see some of these coaches and they don't have spare time for anything like absolutely no. nothing so um yeah that's kind of like my fallback plan I guess um but honestly I'd rather go you know like coach in Ireland or like overseas somewhere and try to like help them out with that or like even like Australia and try to like help them build up their program for to get it back in the Olympics um you know something else um obviously I I just want to go live overseas is what this yeah (laughs) too obviously um which my mom's in full support so we're all good but um yeah I just I, I think I would rather go somewhere else out of out of uh this realm of the u.s um to get into coaching that's really cool because we always talk about how we want to grow the game and how Mm -hmm. and that doesn't just mean here in the states that means globally right so that's really cool that you would do that um and you're from la though well the la area right so Mm -hmm. in terms of set design and stuff there's also like the industry there for you Mm -hmm. Would you ever, like, if you went overseas and and went to school and learned these things, maybe even coach a little bit, whatever you want to do, would you ever consider coming back? Um, yeah, maybe. And I mean, I, so I moved there actually in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, not the yeah. smartest move. Um, but a lot <laughs> of my really closest friends are still there. Um, the problem I found was Hollywood and everybody was yeah. somebody's brother, sister, neighbor's best friend type of thing so um true but Australia actually they've grown their um industry a lot and they're actually pretty well um well renowned for just how they run things and stuff like that but um Marvel just signed some huge deal where they're doing like all sorts of movies and stuff out there so um yeah I'm hoping I'm hoping it's not as um uh nep- nepotism based out there <laughs> maybe I can get in somewhere but um yeah it's just it's definitely it's an adjustment I think obviously like growing up in LA you know you have all these people around you that are like in the industry but then yeah in your 20s and you go out to the bar and it's like oh I'm in the industry and I'm like oh god <laughs> yeah yeah never mind <laughs> so um yeah, it was just not really my, I don't know. I loved LA and obviously some all my friends are there, but um, yeah, it was a little, it was a little tough living there and not cringing every time someone talked to you about anything. <laughs> I could see that. I, it's funny you say that because obviously I've noticed that too, being in Southern California and when I go back yeah. to visit and stuff and you know, there'd be people where it's like, oh, so-and-so's kid goes to this school down the street or something, you know, and it's like, okay. Um, but then when I came to the Bay area, like for school and then stayed here for a while afterwards, it's funny how that can happen sort of in any city and any industry. Meaning like now when I go out, I hear people talking about their startups and like all their Silicon Valley stuff, you know, and, and they're like, (laughs) yeah, these like Silicon Valley bros who are talking about VCs and all this. And I'm like, okay, this is kind of the same thing. It's just a different, you know, (laughs) industry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but but I know what you mean. <laughs> Definitely. Are you a fan of Marvel? I have to ask. Um, I have seen all the movies, but they're kind of the same movie to me every time. It's just kind of pow bam. Yeah, someone <laughs> saved the world, saved. So uh, yeah. yeah, I'm a big Disney Disney geek. Um, yes. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I've seen, I have a little Harry or a Harry Potter, um, a little, um, Peter Pan tattoo. That's my little Disney tribute. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big Disney fan. Um, so yeah, that's as close as I get to, to the Marvel <laughs> universe. <laughs> it it kind of counts since they own Marvel, but okay. Also <laughs> a huge Disney fan. Nice. So let's talk more about this. What is your, is Peter Pan your favorite movie or your favorite character or what, what are your faves? 
Yeah, Peter Pan's definitely one of my favorites. Um, I watched A Little Mermaid so much when I was little that I broke the VHS tape because I was a VHS <laughs> tape. <laughs> um, of course. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for like the older movies for sure. But we used to go to Disneyland like all the time. And that's what I like start looking back on, you know, set design and stuff like that. And like, mm. I was always the kid that was like staring at like all the different like surroundings or whatever i'm like wow i love disneyland because it was like a whole other universe so just loops right right back to you know what you want to get involved in but um yeah no i'm obsessed with disney definitely me and my mom actually were going on a big um paris trip um kind of celebrate end of softball like you know because you don't get to go on vacations growing up so um, totally yeah we actually went on one for my when I turned 30, we were kind of joking around about it in high school about, you know, we don't get to go on these vacations. So I said, okay, when I turn 30, let's go on a big Europe trip. Um, and did we ever, I think it was 20, 22 days and it was like 21 cities or something like that. It was, I mean, Amazing. it was a lot. It was a lot. I don't know if I'd be able to do it again, <laughs> but um, it was definitely amazing. But um, so we're going on the, we're going to Paris kind of as a, this is going to be a more relaxing trip, but we're def- we're going to go to Euro Disney and Disney in Paris now, since we're like going to be a more relaxing trip. Like last time we were there, I was like, we can't go to, we can't spend a whole day in Disneyland when it's like, we're only in Paris for three days. So. Right. You want to um, see the sights. Yeah. 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 I'm really excited. Really excited oh. to see that one. I am so jealous. Literally having like a chocolate croissant at Disneyland Paris sounds like my dream oh, in life. I know. Oh my and God. I saw this like one thing. I just actually saw it on TikTok last week. And it was like, you can make your own wands. They like have this like glass, like it's like the Bippity Boppity Boutique or whatever that's on all of them. And they like make your own wands. Like, okay, I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my, I did not know that. So I, so yeah, nerd whatever (laughs) but I did get a wand at Universal Studios at the Harry Potter world uh in Southern California love it um that's like a wizard or witch wand obviously (laughs) but like this sounds even better I know you have to do that yeah I'm a big I'm a big Harry Potter geek too um I almost bought one we went to I went with my friend Ellen Roberts from Team Australia um she plays in Japan and then our my translator um is like one of my best friends still, but we went to Universal Studios last year and it, I almost bought one, but I had no room in my bags whatsoever. So <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. me. <laughs> the only Fair thing enough. Me. <laughs> Do you know what house you're in? I'm a Slytherin, unfortunately. I've taken it like five times. I've taken the Pottermore cl- the quiz like I like Mm -hmm. delete Mm -hmm. it and retake it and I think I've got I've gotten Ravenclaw twice Slytherin twice and Gryffindor once so okay I'm I'm anything off I'm way too forward (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah so but you identify as Slytherin (laughs) yeah okay Jordan I'm a Slytherin too (gasps) I yes Yes. I took it hard at first like I was like oh You know, and then I did try to retake it, I think, too, at one point. I don't even remember what I got, but then I took it, I think, maybe a third time, and I was Slytherin again. I was like, fine, I'll steer into this. Now I love it. Now I, like, own it. Yes. I'm like, you know what? The loyalty thing, I think, was my big thing. I'm a super, super loyal person. So, um, yeah, as soon as I, like, read the things or whatever, I was like, yeah, that's me. (laughs) <laughs> you're like fine because okay. here's how I think about it too we're the good Slytherins right like we're like the Snapes of the world you know what I mean not yeah. the bad ones yeah <laughs> I think I, I think we're probably a little less creepy than Snape but um. well yeah true true <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. maybe rephrase but yes <laughs> but yeah no I bought like a whole we one of my stops in um uh on their big Europe trip was Edinburgh and I got a little mm. jacket and all that. So it's official. <laughs> oh, we're yeah. like geeking out for about this for like last five minutes. I mean, I would not want to spend my time any, any other way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this is fun. I mean, even hearing you talk about this kind of stuff, like um, the Harry Potter set, for example. Oh, my gosh. Like some mm-hmm. of that stuff would be so cool. 
for yeah. you to work on something like that in the future. That would be amazing. Oh my God, I know. Something like that would be, yeah, unreal. Unreal, yeah. for sure. That is super, super cool. <laughs> so what have you been doing other than, you know, looking into this kind of stuff about what to do next? What else have you been doing since you retired in this short time? Um, well, I'm at my mom's house right now, um, just kind of hanging out so I don't have to pay rent. Um, <laughs> but she's put me into work. I was actually <laughs> 20 minutes before this, I had to go take a shower real fast because I was out in the yard working on her. She's like, I mean, she, um, okay, so she moved from California to Ann Arbor, Michigan um, after I was done playing and she kind of retired and moved out here. But she is definitely um, a garden fan. So her entire house is just there. I mean, I lost track of how many plants that she has, but all outside is just kind of like an English garden. And it's just gotten away from her a little bit. Um, and as I love to say, she saves this entire list, running list of things for me to do or for her to do. Then she magically doesn't do them until I get here. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've been gardening every day, <laughs> every day. And then um, I have a couple of different sewing projects that I'm getting into. I'm actually making a couple of my outfits um, for my Paris trip. So that's exciting. And then um, I'm actually the maid of honor in Kelly Crutchman's wedding. And it's me and Sam Fisher. And Kelly was like, okay, so you guys can wear whatever you want. Like, it just has to be black. So you can like dress like black dress, pantsuit, suits. And me and Sam immediately were like, suits, we're wearing suits. Yeah. <laughs> I um, love that. Yeah. And obviously, 6'1", uh, <laughs> a, a little bit thicker. Um, I'm not going to find a suit that fits me. So I'm actually going to make my own suit. Um, so sorry, I'm looking off of here. It's my dress forms over here. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so Lots of projects. I, I don't know who I thought I was when I s drew up and ordered all this fabric, but um, I have probably a good 12 different outfits um, that I have <laughs> in the middle of designing and pinning. And um, yeah, I haven't finished a single project since 2015. So I really don't know who I thought I was. But um yeah, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm keeping busy for sure. Uh, yeah, that's great. This downtime. But Maybe you'll get into wardrobe too eventually yeah. on, on sets. <laughs> yeah, that would be, that would be the dream for sure. Costume and set, <laughs> that would be really fun. But. That's awesome. I actually got to meet Kelly Kretschmann for the first time um, because she was with Sam Fisher and I played, nice. I've known Sammy since I was like, 11 I think um okay. yeah well we played against each other in high school because she went to Simi Valley as you know and mm -hmm. I went to Westlake and then but we were on our first travel ball team together but anyway they were both at the Stanford Alabama regional in Tuscaloosa this past spring oh, um nice. and yeah so I got to meet her so that's really awesome that you will be doing that for her and for Allie Carta yeah they're the best Allie too yeah Allie Sam those are yeah definitely some of my favorite humans. I talk to them almost yeah. every day. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, they're great. Love them. That's awesome. <laughs> well, and like you all have just, you've been around the game a long time. Um, mm -hmm. you're all like veterans as well. So even like on the, off the field, you guys have amazing relationships. It sounds like, but even on the field, when you think about what people like you guys have learned, like, what do you hope for this next generation coming up of softball players and, what they could do for the game. Well, I mean, every kind of group that of pro softball players that comes through hopes that, you know, the next generation will push a little bit more. Um, yeah. Especially like my, my age group. And I call us like the kind of like lost generation only because there was mm -hmm. so many of us that were um, really good college players and it wasn't quite on tv like it was or like it is now um yeah. and then it was when the u.s when i think it was two years out no one year out of college is when usa and npf they made players choose which which one you go into and at the time it wasn't 
looking like it was going to get in, um, even in 2020. And so there's a lot of us who left for the NPF because we needed to pay bills and the yeah. USA wasn't providing that. Um, and those first couple of years of NPF, it would like, it just, it was so good. And it looked like we were making a lot of progress. And then every year it was kind of like three steps forward, two steps back. Like mm. it was like always like, it looked like it was going to be really good. And then it was like, not some a team would fall out or, you know, someone would retire yeah. or funding wasn't there. Um, and so, you know, when I first started out, um, you had all the big players, big names still playing. Jess Mendoza, Jenny Finch, Kelly Crutchman, um, Andrea Duran, Tasha Watley. Like, they were all still playing. Um, and so it was kind of like the young group through that. And then, you know, it didn't take many seasons. And all of a sudden, I was the oldest one on the team. Like, <laughs> like what happened yeah. to the plot of the story? Um, and so you know, obviously being like a little bit, I'm the old generation now of, uh, of the pro softball players. And you see these girls come in and, you know, they're wide eyed and they're like happy to be there. And, you know, I think I scared some of these rookies, um, especially some of the Oklahoma rookies that probably never heard a cuss word in the last five years. Um, <laughs> but you know, like I, w- I would, I was very vocal, um, it was really sad to see kind of the just like level of um, not respect, but just the level and not even the play. But I felt I I kept saying over and over and over again, same shit, different decade. Like Mm. we were still in the same place and the same BS being pulled. And five, six years later after, I had left and I thought that it was getting better type of thing. Mm, Um, Right. You know, we were still given PB and J sandwiches in between games. Um, Stuff like that, where it's just like, what the hell is happening? And it's because you don't have this older girls, the older girls aren't sticking around anymore to show Mm -hmm. the younger girls like, Hey, this isn't right. This isn't like, this isn't how this is supposed to be like, because if the younger girls don't step up and don't, start vocalizing and saying all these things um and they're they get taken advantage of and um you know I think we saw there was a couple instances this summer of fan interactions and stuff like that and you know my early years in NPF like we had stalker situations like we had cops Mm. called of you know people following us to the hotels and stuff like that and the younger girls don't know anything about that. And they don't know like, Hey, like us saying no to signing an autograph, like isn't being an ass. It isn't being a bitch. Like it's setting a boundary around yourself because you have that set signing time. And like, yeah, like, of course, like you're not going to say no to the little girl that runs up to you or whatever. But like Mm -hmm. we had fans yelling at us to get our asses back in line to sign autographs after we'd been there for two hours. Like, and the younger girls either didn't hear it or just kind of like let it roll off. And I was in the yeah. stands like, who said it? Like, <laughs> you yell at my teammate. Um, and like, obviously, I don't want people to go do that. I don't, I'm not asking, you know, the younger girls to go do that. But I think that when the older girls kind of don't set a standard or don't stick around to set a standard and tell the younger girls like, hey, this is why we do things. You have to stand up for yourself. You have to set boundaries around yourself. Like, you know, just having, just creating like a more professional environment because a lot of times there's not people to do that for us. And Mm -hmm. I like a lot of, you know, the younger girls coming through and not even just the younger girls, just, you know, women, young women in general, don't feel comfortable with doing that and don't feel comfortable with one saying no to setting boundaries around themselves because they're so used to like, you know, like just grateful to be here. And at some point, some generation has to be like, no, we're not just happy to be here. Like we're working our asses off. We're doing the job that these guys are getting paid multi-million dollar contracts are doing. We're dedicating our life to this. Like 
no, like at some point the standard has to be raised and you have to, you know, be able to, like, I shouldn't have to be going into the stands and yelling at people. Like that should never have happened. And that should never have been said to us in the first place of people feeling entitled to our time and to us basically. And that's how, like, Mm -hmm. obviously, you know, other people who all these MLB guys and NFL guys, they probably have stalkers too in situations like that. But like, it's not as dangerous. It's dangerous situation Mm. of, you know, we're just, we're young women by ourselves half the time. Um, Yeah. And so I would just hope, and I think that's why the USA women's soccer um, is doing a great job of right now of demand. They're demanding what they're owed and just, some of these comments and some of these articles written and it's just like, it's always comes back to the same, like, well, they don't have like their fans or their stands are empty. Like, how do you expect to blah, blah, blah. Like, well, nobody's watching their games. So, and I'm like, I'm so tired of that argument. Like I'm so tired of it. But um, yeah, yeah, I just think that at some point the, the younger group has to step up. And that would, that's what I would hope for kind of the next generation is start pushing and start demanding their market value and demanding what they're worth. Um, yeah. But now AU yeah. has this kind of AUX um, thing. And I, I mean, I love what they're doing for the sport, obviously being on ESPN and it's great freaking softball. Like, yeah, it's yeah. really well most of the time anyways. Um, great softball. The whole bottom of the seventh thing, playing out the bottom of the seventh thing. You can miss me with that, though. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, hey, shortstop, you want to pitch this one? Like, no, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's just at some point, like the players have to step up and you know demand what they're earned because right now that's or not even right now the last 10, 15 years. It's the athletes that are suffering. So yeah. that's what I would hope for this next next gen is just to push and demand what they're worth. Yeah. This actually brings me back to the beginning of our conversation where you were saying some of your friends, like softball or not, will be like, hey, Jordan, I just stood up for myself. Yeah. You know, it's like this, <laughs> yeah. this theme that I'm seeing with you, which is just yeah. standing up for yourself, you know, yeah. um, and that that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, before I let you go, um, I wanted to play a game with you that I play with everyone who comes on the show. Okay. It's, it's easy. It's fun. Uh, it's called Safer Out. So now actually you get to be the umpire. You oh, get yeah. to decide Safer Out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not in their hands anymore. It's, it's you now. Love it. <laughs> but basically, I'll, just, I'll bring up a topic. Um, if you like it or you agree with it, you'll call it safe. If you don't, then you'll call it out. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. So the first one is pitcher armbands, like getting the signal using the armband system. Safer out. Oh, out. I could no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I wouldn't even be able to do it as a coach. No, out. <laughs> out. All the way I'm, out. <laughs> I'm kind of with you. I just and I don't know if it's just because we never had that, you know, so it's just not familiar, but yeah. yeah, I don't fully understand the phenomenon, but no, I think I mean there's enough creative ways to come up with whatever, and it because even I see the armband like people miss signs still with the armband. So it's like <laughs> True. at some point, like at some point, you just got to be creative with you know. I think there's just so many different ways of calling pitches and doing all that that yeah, um, it seems silly. Or it's like the way it seems excessive i think yeah i see what you're saying it's like the way to do it. it's like we'll put an ear, like an earpiece in their ear i guess and just tell oh, them what to throw like if we're gonna you know pull an astros know, which <laughs> yeah which they're kind of starting to do with like football and other things so oh, i yeah. don't know yeah no all the way out i yeah. think okay <laughs> all right fair enough first one's out um second one is name image likeness safer out Oh, like the, oh, the NILs? Yes. Yeah, um, like people making money. I would say, yeah, I would say safe, but I think it's overdone. Um, mm. 
because some of these, especially some of these rookies coming in, were telling me how much they were getting paid, and like it made us look like chump change. Like they were, mm. they weren't motivated to play after college because they were getting paid fifteen grand a month just for showing up to class. So I was like, excuse me. <laughs> oh my what? gosh! Yeah. So, but also, I just think it's these mid majors and you know the Cinderella schools aren't going to happen anymore. Like they're not, they don't stand a chance against some of these bigger schools. Like they just don't like, and you have, you know, boosters calling up players mid season, telling them, Hey, if you transfer next year, I'll give you fill in the blank money. Like, "Mm." and it's just some sketchy stuff going on right now. So I would say, I would say yes into being able to put your face on a poster and get lessons or selling jerseys in the, whatever, but this whole Mm. like under the table money. Nah, nah, not for me. (laughs) Yeah. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. All right. Well, two outs. This is definitely, you know, (laughs) you at your best as a pitcher. (laughs) Safe for how it was intended. True. True. You did say safe technically. Out for what it's being taken to. Yeah, that's true. You did. Okay. That's fair. Okay. All right. (laughs) Well, last one is bat flips. Safer out. Uh, oh, gosh. I think the non-premeditated bat flips. Like, <laughs> I think I think the bat flips, because I obviously I'm a very emotional player. And but when people would like say like, well, you fist pump when you get a big strikeout. Like, that's the same thing. And like. Is it though? Is it though? I don't think it's the same thing. I I think, yeah, because you're not throwing equipment. That's different, I think. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm good with like the emotion of it, of a bat flip, but I feel like people were like bat flipping when it was like eight, the team was like winning eight to nothing or they were losing eight to nothing. And I'm like, why are you bat, why are you bat flipping? Um, Yeah. I honestly, I have more of a problem with the slow jog around the um yeah yeah that's fair that's a fair call out yeah I've 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 hit a person or two um for taking approximately (laughs) a minute to get around (laughs) the bases Mm. so I mean I don't yeah I mean I don't really have a problem with that flips but I think it's just gotten a little a little out of hand yeah, I'll say I out. See that. I'll say out on that one too. <laughs> yeah, the you know what the jog is a great call out. I remember in college we were winning um, by quite a bit actually, and somebody hit home run and they did like this like Sammy Sosa shuffle, um, and we were like, why you know? And then they took their time going around. It's like okay, you're still losing yeah. by seven. I don't I don't know what the point of this is. Yeah. So that's a really good point. People don't usually bring that up, but that's a really good point. Yeah, to me it's just selfish behavior. I'm not, I'm not a fan yeah. of selfish behavior. I think that's what it comes down to. But I'm like emotion and emotions and like yelling and whatever. Like if you hit a home run, if you hit a walk off home run off of me and you did a bat flip, whatever. But if it's like something, you know, where it's you're losing or winning or whatever, like, nah. Yes. Yeah. Like, calm down. <laughs> that's fair. That's yeah. very fair. Yeah. Well, thank you for this. Th- this. This was really fun. It was great to like kind of, We'll connect for the first time, but I guess with the SoCal ties, like get to sort of bring it back um, and get to know you a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I appreciate you coming on and taking the time, especially because you're newly retired. You know, you're, this is the next phase for you. So it's really exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do. Yeah. Thank you. It was good to chat with Jordan, you know, run it back a little bit, nerd out a little bit and just kind of get a glimpse into what this next phase of her life could possibly be. So with that, let's transition to the foul tip of the week. This week's foul tip is about being strong in our convictions. And I meant what I said to Jordan, the fact that when her friends stand up for themselves, they think of her, they associate that kind of self-respect with her. That's a big compliment. Because it's so much easier said than done. And a lot of us always want that for people we care about, like our friends and our family. We want them to stand up for themselves because we feel like they deserve it. But sometimes we forget that for ourselves. 
And not only in standing up for ourselves, but standing up for our values. Because, you know, to stand up for them, you also have to know what they are. You know, what do you value? I think once you know that, it makes it easier to go through life because they're your anchors and you want to protect those anchors. And those really are your convictions. And I've met some people in life, you know, who might emphasize values more or less than I do in their lives, or certain values might just resonate a little bit differently. We might just think a little bit differently. But if I see them committed to those values and protecting them, you can't help but have some respect for that, even if it's a little bit different. And if you do that too, you know, there's some confidence that exists within that. And I'd much rather have someone be upfront and very clear about who they are and what they care about than someone who doesn't really stand for anything and you can't really tell who they really are. And I think this kind of came to light a little bit, too, when we had Rhonda Ravel, the Nebraska head coach, on the show a little bit earlier this season. And she talked about this a bit, you know, when she came on and about some of the Big Ten relationships that she has. And she specifically mentioned how Hutch speaks her mind and stands by her beliefs. And maybe that she's not quite as vocal as that, but that she really respects that. And she also posted her support, you know, for Hutch after the retirement was announced. And they are real friends. You know, both are pioneers in our sport. And I can't tell you how special that is, especially when they've been competitors for so long, for all of these years. But there is still a real friendship there. And I do think part of that is a reflection of their strong convictions. And it comes back to authenticity, really, which makes you a better player coach, professional, friend, and just person. If you want to hear more about that, you can listen to that episode as well as Samantha Finley, Marissa Young, and of course, this one with Jordan Taylor. But that's it. Be strong in your convictions. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball, part of the Believe Network and presented by Bet Online. The show is available anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you listen, including Believe.com, and you can watch the videos on YouTube too. Subscribe, rate, and if you liked it, write a review for the show. Help us out. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. You can always reach out to me on Twitter at JennaBacera01 and Instagram at JennaBacera as well. As always, thank you for tuning in and catch you soon.